morning, everyone. How's everyone doing today? Great? Awesome? Brilliant. I'm great, too. I'm really excited today for our lesson. So, by a show of hands here, who did their homework last night? If you don't remember, it was the reading Do or Die, and it was an awesome story by Gilgamesh. Awesome! Everyone did the reading. Okay, so, we're going to discuss it today. Um, so, we're going to be learning about uh, myths, epics, and we're going to be learning about how they are established so through the use of literary devices such as metaphors similes personification and we're also going to be going over some vocabulary that you may have found a little difficult so um let's begin so today we're starting off by defining the story do or die does anyone know um what kind of genre this story falls under does anyone know what a genre is brilliant you guys all know that's awesome so what genre does this story fall under? John? Awesome. You're right. Correct. This story, Do or Die, falls under the genre of a myth. Who here knows what a myth is? All of you? You guys are brilliant. Okay, so raise your hand and tell me one characteristic of a myth. So, what describes a myth, and what is a myth usually entail? Um, and if you can't remember any characteristics, think about uh, Gilgamesh. Think about his bravery and his character, and give me some character attributes that would describe Gilgamesh, and you'll find that they coincide very closely to a myth. Okay, so who can tell me a characteristic? Hmm. Alicia, give me one. Okay. That's a good idea. You're on the right track. However, let's think, think more broadly. Don't, don't think very specifically. Think more broadly. So give me another example. I know you have some in your head. So think of Gilgamesh and his character. Ah, exactly. So myths usually involve a hero. And I'm going to go over the two different types of myths that are usually prevalent. So there is a origin myth, which describes a, a great tale of how a hero came to be or how something became to be. And there are also hero myths. So hero myths describes a, an adventure. So it's a hero who goes on an adventure to do something miraculous or something uh, extraordinary. So give me some more uh, characteristics of a myth. Paul? Perfect. They can either be true or false. Some myths are thought to believe that are true and, and different cultures uh, adopt them and they believe in them. Sometimes there is a religion even formed out of them. Yes, so another characteristic, another characteristic. Janice? Yeah, yeah, generally, generally. In myths, the hero is always victorious. So who can tell me how myths uh, become so, so extraordinary and so vast? How do they spread? Like, how do people learn of these myths all around the world? Paul? Yeah, that's, that's true. That's true. People talk about it. And they spread it. These are called oral traditions. Awesome. So from this map, we can see that a myth details a hero going on an adventure. It can either be real or fiction. And the hero does something extraordinary and comes out victorious. And it is spread through culture by oral traditions. Awesome. Great job, guys. Let's see. Alright. So now we're going to go over some vocabulary that might have been somewhat difficult for you. So as I read the story, even I had some difficult with some of them. I had to look at the word twice and maybe think about, okay, you know, that's what this word means. So did anyone have any trouble with any specific words? Hmm. Janet? Okay, splendor. That is a great word. So, splendor, 
Blender means, um, it means, we can infer that something is bright or something is uh, glorious, something glorious and bright. So if you could turn to page 64, I'd like someone to volunteer to read the third paragraph. Great, thank you. So, in this sentence, you can deduce that uh, Gilgamesh was glorious. He was bright, he was strong, he was fierce. So, any other words that were a little difficult for you? And don't be shy, you know, I'll point some out if you guys can't think of any off the spot. Malign? Ooh, that is a 10 point word. Malign. So, Malign, well, let's go to the sentence and we can check it out. So, Malign, if you could turn to page 69, can somebody read me the sentence? Let's see, it is on the last sentence of the second paragraph. John, go ahead. Okay, awesome. So, here, we can tell that Malign is something bad. It means evil. It means something odious. Something meant to harm. So, malign, that's what exactly what it means. Good job. Mm, I could think of one. Rash. Now, I know what you're all thinking. Rash, you know, oh, I got stung by a bee and I got, I got a rash now. You know, that is one definition of the word rash. However, rash has two definitions. Um, rash can also mean some, someone who is hasty, someone who acts on impulse, so they don't think about what they're doing. They act on impulse. So if you can turn to page 65 and read me the sentence in the second paragraph, last sentence in the second paragraph, that'd be great. Cynthia, go ahead. Awesome. So here, clearly rash doesn't mean an itchy, a sore on your body. Rash means Impatient action can also mean reckless, many other things. So, the old wise councilmen in the city thought that Gilgamesh was acting rash. They knew how big Hua Hua was, but they, they saw that Gilgamesh still wanted to attack him and go and slay the demon. So they thought his impulse was rash. However, they don't know that Gilgamesh is actually a very strong warrior in battle. Okay, so I think that, that leaves us pretty well off on this vocabulary word. Let's move on. So we're going to talk about literary devices. Does anyone know what a literary device is? Okay, so I'll explain it. A literary device is a technique a writer uses to convey a message or to add a special effect to their writings. So some literary devices are metaphors, similes, personification, and hyperbole. So we're gonna start off with metaphors. So metaphors can be a little confusing to describe, but once you understand it, it's really simple to make a metaphor. So a metaphor is when the subject is implied to be another subject and to make a comparison between their similarities. So the purpose of a metaphor it's to take a subject we understand and compare it to a subject we don't understand in order to learn something from it. Still confused? Here, have an example. So, Gilgamesh is a lion on a battlefield. This is a metaphor. So, assuming we don't know much about Gilgamesh, we do know a lot about lions. So, what are lions? Lions are these fierce, big, strong, fast creatures. So, you're saying that Gilgamesh is a lion, that means that Gilgamesh is also big, fierce, strong, and fast. So, that's a decent example of a metaphor. Another example is, Huawa is a devilish monster. So, assuming we don't know much about Huawa, we do know much about devilish monsters. So, what's a devilish monster? A scary, big, menacing, evil creature. So, we can say that Huawa is like a devilish monster, so he is also mean, scary, evil creature. So that's what a metaphor is. Uh, so a simile is also a comparison. It's like a metaphor, but it's not. It's a little different. So similes are comparisons using the words like 
such as an app. So a metaphor compares an object and says that it is a, a thing. A simile compares an object and says it's like a thing. It's as a thing. It's such as a thing. So an example of a, of a simile is the student is like a mouse in front of the teacher. So obviously the student is not a mouse, but he's like a mouse. And what are mouse? Mouse are quiet, you know, shy creatures. So you're saying that the student is like a mouse, so he's shy too, and he's quiet in front of the teacher. Another example is, Enkidu is like a scholar. He always thinks before acting. So a, a scholar spends his days writing and reading and researching and doing uh, scholarly things. They think about things. Enkidu also thinks about things. He always thinks about his actions before he does them. So you're not saying he is a scholar. He's like a scholar. Um, so that's the difference. The similes and metaphors are very alike. The only difference is that similes use like, as, and such as when comparing. Um, another literary device. This one's fun. It's called personification. So does anyone know what personification means? No? Okay. So personification literally means to give unhuman objects human-like qualities. Confusing? Maybe some examples will help clear it up. Okay, so his hungry eyes. This is personification. Obviously, eyes can't be hungry. Eyes don't eat. But you're saying that his eyes are hungry. That means that they're, they're searching for something. They're, they want something. Just like when you're hungry, you want food. So this is personification. Another example is the light danced across the sky. Obviously, light can't dance. Humans can dance, light can't. Because that means that light is soaring through the sky as if it were dancing. This personification. Got it? No? One more example. Hmm, how about... Oh, this one's fun. Uh, my alarm clock yells at me every morning. It's like, <laughs> yeah, so it's not directly yelling at me. Alarm clocks can't speak, they don't have voices. But it's so loud and it wakes me up, it seems like it's yelling to me. So, there it is. You're giving... An alarm clock, a human-like quality. That's what personification means. Hyperbole, now this is another literary device. A hyperbole literally means an exaggeration. Does everyone know what an exaggeration means? What does an exaggeration mean, Lisa? Exactly. An exaggeration means when you exaggerate the truth, when you, when you say something is bolder and bigger than it really is. So an example of a hyperbole is... The old man's stomach was as big as a mountain. <laughs> Obviously, it's not as big as a mountain, but you're saying that the old man's stomach is very, very big, comparing it to a mountain. And this is an exaggeration, because no one can have a mountain as a stomach. But that's a hyperbole. Another example is Huawa's feet were bigger than a house. So maybe, maybe they were, because they do describe Huawa as a giant, but saying that his feet are as big as a house, that's a Monstrous, monstrous feet. Obviously, they can't be that big, so it's an exaggeration. That's what a hyperbole is. Now, does anyone want to give me an example of hyperbole? Lisa? <laughs> Perfect, okay. So, although I don't think it's true, that's a great example of a hyperbole. My tests are not as hard as medical exams, but they can be a bit challenging. So I think you guys all have a firm grasp on what these literary devices are. So why do authors use them? Well, authors use these literary devices as tools and techniques to help convey their message. They're, they're powerful tools that bring clarity to a text. Um, so that's this lesson. Um, obviously, this isn't where it would end. Um, I would go on to have the students create their own examples of literary devices, as well as explain um, how the author of Do or Die use these literary devices to create this myth. Um, this lesson was catered to 11 to 13 year olds uh, in an intermediate level and they were English speakers. Um, so that's it for this lesson, this demo video. I hope to hear back from your school and have a nice day. Bye.